give us something, each of you, that would be a good thing that people can do to apply to their everyday lives just to perform that little bit better in an everyday sense? Maybe, yep. Sai, you go first. Oh, I was going to go first. Go on, you, oh, go, you, you go, go first then, right, Leslie. You, go first. You, you two decide. Okay. okay, okay, okay. So mine is an alter ego. That's been my biggest thing that I have hung my performances around. Because I think as a youngster, I really lacked a lot of confidence. And I was so worried about what other people thought and the expectations on my mm-hmm. shoulders. And really the only way to move beyond that was to adopt an alter ego. Um, and many people do it, in fact. And, and, and most people kind of do it anyway naturally. But once you define it a little bit, you work in it like a project, then it can really help you. Um, so for me, it was utilizing my acting gra- background to create this alter ego and find behaviors, find sayings, find looks and stances and lots of different ways to achieve this person I felt I needed to be on the start line. And, um, you know, because you need to certainly in my sport of Xterra, which is off right road, you really need to commit. You need to be quite aggressive with your level of commitment. You can't half ass it. So um, I started to create an alter ego based on Conor McGregor, the MMA fighter, because I'm secretly, I'm, I'm, I, I would love to be an MMA fighter. That's my sort of secret thing. But anyways. Um, yeah. Look out, Simon. <laughs> God, yeah, I can't sorry. face it anymore. <laughs> it's exhausting. <laughs> so what I loved about Conor McGregor, you know, whether mm-hmm. you like him or don't like him, um, the point is, is that he doesn't care what anyone thinks. And again, this might be his alter ego, mm-hmm. right? But he has this unbridled confidence, the way he holds his shoulders, the way he walks into a room, the way he faces people. And there was a certain sort of, um, there were certain aspects of his his personality and his stance and his behaviors that I thought, maybe I should start to mirror that and see if I can adopt it. Just by being it, I can adopt it, adopt that mindset. Uh, and so, yeah, I kind of created this whole character um, called Paddy McGinty. Um, you know, sort of a costume for Paddy, a, a stance for Paddy, mm-hmm. a stare, like these certain things that could trigger this air of kind of, I don't give mm-hmm. an F. Um, and I really practiced it a lot. Um, and then I started to adopt it in training. And then during certain training sessions, if I was having a bad day, there, you know, I'd have all of these triggers that could bring about Paddy. Um, and, and that, you know, uh, uh, I was able to sort of then put that into my race performance. And in fact, in our book, we put together an alter ego kit where you can mm-hmm. create your own. So, you know, get pictures, get videos and music and all of these sensory things that can help you get into the space. And so I can kind of talk about the science behind actually why that helps your brain, because this is really cool, I think. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not just dress up, make believe. There's now some really compelling neuroscience evidence about why imagining yourself or thinking about yourself as a third person it really helps your brain by chemistry for stress, for pain tolerance, for confidence. And many athletes, um, the trouble is that they see there the thing that's stopping, that they see it in the way, whether it's temperament or personality wise, getting in their way of their greatness or excellence is this huge bait, this thing at the base of a mountain. Which, oh, I don't know how I can ever do it. And well, what about if you just faked it, right? So, so faking till you're making it is an evidence-based statement now. There's lots of great evidence to say so. And it's really upended how psychology is done because we always thought that if we have to start with how you think and we change that, that will t- affect how you feel and then you'll start to act more, blah, blah, blah. And now you can reverse engineer it. So even if you're rotting inside <laughs> and scared shitless and nervous and then feel impostering, uh, you can put on these behaviors, uh, exert these behaviors, and you can shift that mindset fairly quickly. So it's really interesting. The, the, the psychological term is embodied cognition, but it's a, a really compelling sort of psychological. And you, we know in therapy, right, you talk to the puppet or imagine if you were standing here, what would you say to your brother, eight-year-old self? Or, so there's been a long history of that in sport. So yeah, it's a really powerful technique. And I did it when I, I'm an introvert and I had to start teaching 300, 500 students. And it was a, a dreadful, really nerve-wracking experience. And so you fake it. You you all the, you, the people you admire, public speakers, you <coughs> imitate their cadence of speech, their posture, and lo and behold, you start to believe it yourself, and it turns you into 
something or it certainly improves your skills. So it's a really, yeah, it's a really powerful technique. Leslie, when did Paddy McKinty last came up, come out? Oof, probably Sunday. Last night in the bedroom. Oh, sorry, <laughs> this is a PG show. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> oh, my gosh. ba mm. um, Actually, throughout this process, you know, the whole award circuit, um, because... You know, this is my first foray and all of a sudden I was catapulted up into this stratosphere I could not mm-hmm. have imagined being in in my wildest dreams. And I ended up um, being part of a writer's panel at the Santa Barbara Film Festival, which is a really f- famous film festival. And on this panel were the biggest writer directors in the world. And I was sat there going, like I walked out on stage. I didn't really understand. I didn't realise the magnitude of the event until I arrived there and I'm speaking to, oh, there's Tony Kushner. Oh, mm-hmm. there's Martin McDonough. Oh, there's Ryan Johnson, who just did Glass Onion. Um, you know, and then uh, who's the Nobel Prize winning? Oh, Richard? yeah, the Japanese author. The Japanese author cool. that wrote uh, Living, mm-hmm. who's a Nobel Prize winner. And it was just, like lined up on the state, Todd Field as well. And I'm like, oh, my God. And I'm sat there just going oh this is my first film you know and I thought no shoulders back engage with the audience be Mm -hmm. authentic um you know you know doesn't matter what people think of you just believe that you had you you know you have the right to be here and you know all of those things Mm -hmm. and yeah that's definitely when Paddy came out (laughs) in terms of better everyday performance what would be a, a great place to start for people as far as you're Yeah, concerned. I mean, there's probably, oh my gosh, there's lots. that w- But ones that I think, because um, it's funny, because in sports psychology, people come to you with a usually a specific problem, nerves, anxiety, or confidence, and they they want a sort of a quick silver bullet fix, as though, you know, you could teach topspin tennis serve in like five minutes and then be world-class at it. So they all take some practice, but there are a few, I've learned a few toolbox uh, tricks that work very quickly and I think the starting point is that how we think and feel is largely determined by our nervous system right so uh, our internal experience um, is still at a property of our physiology and in fact mind and body are no longer considered to be separate things they're kind of one and uh, one and the same and so calming your self for performance uh, becomes starts with an exercise in calming your physiology and some new neuroscience has found that there are a couple of breath techniques that work within 15 to 20 seconds um, to calm you down very very quickly and we now know the neural pathways of why this works and and so on and so I kind of have a few of those one is called physiologic sigh breathing if you're familiar with Andrew Huberman the, the yep. Stanford neuroscientist who's well is a big proponent of this and their lab in at Stanford and it's one where so at any time you're going into some big thing that you want to be the best version of yourself for it doesn't have to be sport it could be a big presentation it'd be going into you know break up with somebody or ask for a pay rise anything that you're kind of your shit and bricks about and you just really want to okay, I need to remember, I need to have my wits about me. And so it just involves you breathing in through your nose twice, one on top of the other. I'll show, I'll show you what it looks like in a moment. And then holding your breath for the same amount of time as those two in-breaths. And then breathing out for double the length of the in-breath. So it sounds like kind of a weird, convoluted explanation. But each phase of this is really physiologically and neurologically important for this reaction to calm yourself down. So it looks like this, you're going... <sighs> And if you do that twice, three time, after three times, you don't get much more of a benefit. You are giving your nervous system a fighting chance of having your skills come out that are hopefully well practiced and already there. The memory, the things that you need to remember on the day and say in the right order will have a better chance of coming out. Because when we get nervous, when this fight or flight response comes, we narrow, our attention narrows quite drastically Uh, cortisol and adrenaline, all these other fight or flight uh, uh, neurotransmitters and hormones ramp up, which is great for performance, but they can come at a price. And so we all become unglued by our strengths, not our weaknesses, actually, which is quite a strange thing, counterintuitive thing to say. So the things that make us who we are also are the things that unglue us. So if you're a very driven, dedicated person like Leslie, 
you know, you become almost obsessed and almost, you know, they're prone to addiction and all the other things that we know that these very driven people are like. So if you can control your physiology quite quickly, that's really important. And then that's also a way to do the other big thing, which is being learning to stay present in the moment and not being a, your brain, we've been cursed and blessed with a, a frontal cortex that can time travel. We can imagine things that have never happened uh, with all that we want to happen. And it's often the death of a performance artist, athlete or otherwise. And so learning to be able to say what's important for the next two minutes to be the best version of myself possible and focusing on outcomes or goals that are not necessarily about the performance itself, but about the process of what I need to do. 